All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is event trader Gavin McGuire here. Uh, just looking at the markets, and we are near session highs, which seems like something we've been saying a lot for the last three weeks. So, gonna invite Brett Manning in here right now and uh, start getting his early thoughts on 2020 as we're about two weeks in. This is our first sentiment and flow show since the start of the new year. Um, when we last left the course, we were discussing about this price action looking like the um, candidate that would most likely appear, and certainly that has come to fruition. We talked a lot about in late 2019 that, uh, that potential move, and we have been seeing that over the last couple of months. Uh, Brett, Boom. Brett, Boom! Exactly, Brett. Boom. Okay. Uh, I was just was making sure that you were um, that your audio was fine. But uh, you know, Brett, just kind of recapping on our uh, back half of 2019, we talked a lot about how sentiment data was certainly more dour than what we were seeing in positioning, um, and that that could flip on a switch because a lot of that sentiment data was around geopolitical issues such as Brexit, such as the uh, phase one trade deal um, to a certain extent to the impeachment process that was going on. And really it seems like one by one we've started to see those things fall uh, fall to the wayside and make room for people coming off the sidelines. Now, the second part of this leg, we haven't necessarily gotten confirmation on, and uh, but we are starting to see a few signs here and there, and that's going to be better earnings and better economic data, particularly from the rest of the world, as the U.S. didn't seem to slip uh, as much as some of the other countries. But um, what's your early take on 2020, and uh, just kind of recapping from your vantage point, how you saw 2019 end up with our analysis and uh, is going into 2020 right now? Sure. So I, I think um, the one factor that you left out of that explanation is 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 important too, which is that in, in Q3, it was probably the toughest comp situation that we've seen in a long time because it, it everything on year over year basis referred back to Q3 of 2018 which was probably like you know the the main second derivative impact of the fiscal stimulus that was the tax reform bill so everything was sort of jacked up in Q3 2018 and when Q3 2019 rolls around suddenly those those comps are really difficult and that's also when Things really went off the rail in terms of a flare-up of the U.S.-China trade war, and I think that there was a lot of feed-through in terms of upstream supply chain decisions, inventory management, people not wanting to take a lot of risk, and and you know that that's obviously in the asset markets as well, and that's when we got the steady inversion of uh, some of those different uh, versions of the yield curve. So everything looked like the sort of typical. The cycle is rolling over. We saw a big jump in recession expectations, and that all fed a kind of uh, a positioning and sentiment narrative that was a, a terrific basis for the type of extension that we're seeing now. Once it turns out that all of that was kind of a smokescreen for a cycle that was still healthy and, and a slow burn cycle that's finally starting to maybe go around the corner and turn into a more a faster burning cycle. It, it's less sustainable. Um, but the risk acceptance is really coming on now. And I think that we do see that feed through. So, yeah, just as you talked about, there's sort of two parts to this. One is, you know, the speculative discounting by the market, and the second is the kind of fundamental justification for the breakout that we're seeing. And I think that that is – there's a feedback there. Um, it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because risk acceptance tends to feed – back through. I mean, there was a Bloomberg story, the Bloomberg Consumer Comfort Index just hit a 19-year high. And a lot of that is being attributed to people just seeing the stock market launching at new all-time highs. And it's basically the sense of, well, tomorrow is probably going to be better than yesterday. And so I can take on more risk. I can worry less about, you know, I'm walking right into a negative economic event. Um, that puts a negative pressure on savings rate. It puts a positive pressure on hiring, spending, uh, expansion of inventories, business investment, lending, borrowing, everything. So it feeds back. Just when you get people feeling like tomorrow's going to be better than yesterday, they tend to, to act in a way that is consistent with economic expansion. So, it, you know, 
we may call this like sort of animal spirits, but I think that that's starting to maybe happen to some extent. Um, and we saw it in the in the Philly Fed new orders this morning as as another indication. We're starting to see it leak into into some of the leading indicators. But again, this is this is you know this is like pouring pouring lighter fluid on a fire where you only have a certain amount of wood. This this does expedite on a time frame when maybe we get to the point where we have an unsustainable expansion that needs to retrench or correct. So we're 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 speeding up the process now as people are starting to to throw caution to the wind a bit more. See, now, one thing that um, I, I would disagree a little bit with you, I don't know if this is what you're implying, is um, with the Philly Fed, I find that completely different in terms of sentiment reading from, say, like a robocall or a lobocall, just because uh, Philly Fed's obviously a little bit more steeped in economic sentiment. And uh, sure. while you could certainly argue robo and lobo to a certain degree or two, um, I do find that that's one of the more interesting aspects in terms of if we start seeing that economic data or the earnings data really start ramping up here then I, I think that's the basis for that next leg up no no I'm, I'm i'm not suggesting the philly fed is a contrarian data point at all okay 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 i'm just saying it, it's a leading indicator on better economic data coming right right okay yeah i think about but, but i think that it is stoked by people feeling like tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday which is the fundamental feeling of you know of a boom of an expansion like I, that but I, but they eventually to, use that up right that as is a process as opposed to the end of 2019 when we we're seeing that data weaker and the hard data not following through and the weaker sediment data was just due to that cautious out outlook and tone around the geopolitics yeah i mean so just just for explanatory purposes i mean i have a very particular philosophy of what cyclicality is and to me it is built of of movement along a spectrum from extreme risk aversion to extreme risk acceptance and at a certain point you get to the point where you're basically you're you're there's too much risk acceptance and people look at the downturns that we see throughout history as being inspired by a particular event you know the sort of Bernanke uh, car accident version of the end of the cycle and I, I really I disagree with the notion that it has to do with the event. I think the event becomes an excuse if the right type of, of, of negative event happens when people are overly maximally exposed to risk, it becomes a cycle ending event. But the, the real cause of the downturn is the, 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 the uh, excess exposure to risk. The vulnerability is built up to a point where it's like a toxin in the system. If everybody is in a situation where they're hanging out off the end of a of a of a thin limb, then it doesn't take much to start to 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 knock over the dominoes. So, um, I okay. think that the cycle is moving in that direction at this point. But yeah, seeing there there's certainly we got to the point where there was so much retrenchment over the period from let's say July, August, September of last year that you can exploit this reacceleration and probably for quite a, a bit of an extension. Okay, that, that, that's interesting because you talk about um, an event and, uh, you know, that could be pretty wide open for interpretation. Absolutely. Uh, but but, but I, I think we got a nice little case study that we could just throw at it and I'd like to hear your opinion. And I think I know the answer to it, but obviously we had the uh, dust up in Iraq between the U.S. and Iran, um, mm -hmm. you know, caused a couple of hiccups in the market. Uh, but, you know, we're still a little bit earlier in the the, that cycle I think that you're talking about and therefore we were able to dust off a quick drop and um, just see things launch higher I know me and you were talking about it but um, how does this does an event like Iran kind of play into the context that you're thinking in terms of that big event that could end the cycle when there's too much um, when, when there's uh, too much risk an excess of risk acceptance yeah yeah Right. When, when when people have overly exposed themselves, and to me the image is that turtle that is actually outside of a shell standing on a beach with a for sale sign on the shell and a party hat on. You know, that is the point where it doesn't take much to start the, the feedback loop in the other direction. But as I said, right, right well, off the you're bat. You're seeing them, you're better off selling stuff anyway, right, Brett? <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It's basically the opposite of seeing the the sort of stereotypical big bottom where everybody is sitting, you know, in a bunker with canned food and bars of gold, you know, 
worried about the apocalypse, like after everything is ruined. I mean, at a certain point, if no one is exposed to risk on any level, there's only one direction for things to go, and that's up as people gradually start to take on more risk. And gradually, the savings rate goes down. Gradually, the spending goes up. Gradually, the lending starts to, to you know, occur again. I mean, everything becomes a feedback loop at that point. It, because the actions of any given individual as they start to accept risk changes the context for everyone else who then senses that things are improving and starts to take the same kind of action. It's the, it's the Turtle Beach metaphor, you know, through and through. Um, but we need to get to that point where it's an over acceptance of risk to the point where there's so much vulnerability. And right off the bat with the Iran situation, I said in my first post that I didn't see it as being something that was really operative for the cycle or for the stock market. I thought it was important for gold and oil, um, and that to the extent there was a shakeout in the equities market, that that would likely be a buying opportunity. Um, now, now I really, on, on, on go the ahead. flip side of that, Brett, I guess um, for that to be that moment, that would be something where you would need to see that excessive risk that's um, been taking place, that, that uh, all of a sudden we start seeing some of the cracks in that. So it could potentially be a moment like that just this time around it simply wasn't because we were in the cycle yeah right it could it could be and i suppose that you know the, the if if the iran situation were to evolve into something that was different qualitatively in terms of you know where regional alliances are concerned and and bringing maybe uh, china and russia into the equation and 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 it becoming really a, a fundamentally different situation um that would be probably more likely, um, but I, you know, I, I tend to think that the problems arise on a cyclical basis when you're destroying something uh, that's been of value to the to, to the system that's that's defined the the cycle. And in this case, I think that there's nothing that's been more central to that process than low interest rates and and uh, corporate debt and funding everything with the debt side of the equation. And I think that somehow the story that we're writing leads to a chapter at some point where we end up with that mechanism starting to falter. And I'm not exactly sure what that's made of, and it might be some kind of reawakening about the possibility that inflation can exist. Um, it, because certainly a little right bit. now... The, the, the organizing principle that we have, and we can talk more about this, but, but in our strategy meeting, we laid out the notion of what I called the contextual bullish perfect storm, and a big, a big part of that is the Fed's pledge that they've made, and I refer to this again in my notes this morning. The Fed has effectively pledged that when you see good economic data, don't worry because we're not going to move toward tightening economic policy or monetary policy until we have manifestly, manifestly have an inflation problem. And, and Not I, just that we start to see things picking up, but we need to see a manifest inflationary problem before we start I, to talk. I would note with this week's run-up, CPI, PPI, import-export prices, none of them have shown any sort of sign of manifesting uh, pricing pressures at this point, too, which has to play in. Right. So just, just by seeing a pickup in the Philly Fed or retail sales, people don't have to start worrying about the Fed hiking. And that is, I think... The, you know, that's the that's that's one of the most important engines driving everything right now. It's just the fact that the party is not going to be taken away. The punch bowl is not going to be taken away just because the, the 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 context continues to improve, and so there's not this this kind of uh, this kind of negative uh, bias attached to market reactions. The, the reaction function isn't isn't colored by that when we start to see see you know good data. Right, and of course, as I mentioned, the hard data, but even the soft data, too, from all the sentiment surveys this week, Brett, um, Beige Book included, and you could throw in the Fed commentary, inflation just isn't on the horizon right now as far as people are concerned. So that, I agree with you, remains one of the potential black swans. Um, now, we would have to uh, put in, because we're getting around the two-year anniversary of the uh, January 2018 uh, sell off when the trade wars really started to come into focus and I guess that's probably the best example of a key event that really uh, could disrupt anything that's going that's uh, happening right now um, would inflation be kind of your number one uh, threat to the market at this point with the knockout well, I, effect obviously being the impact on monetary policy 
So I would say it this way. It's not in terms of saying what seems likely, but right. it is in terms of saying if, if, if you could imagine any new sort of theme to enter the equation, what would have the most dramatic negative impact on things? I think certainly the idea that – because there, I, I think we must be at the all-time low right now, all-time low in terms of people – worrying about the negative connotations of inflation and and the likelihood of it like that we're at a point where it's just well, again, well, we and again did, every we day did get that in a survey two months ago right what the all-time low and um concerns over inflation. oh yeah, yeah yeah right actually yeah i meant yeah. sort of conceptually but just right. every day i just see more research about you know new new theories as to why inflation is now impossible forever and how interest rates are clearly going to be at zero for all eternity, and that it was that it was you know a 20th century phenomenon that there was uh, an importance to the central bank actually hiking, and like you know that there it's there's there's such a it's different this time kind of uh, 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 tone to to the the I guess right. the, and, the and culture of the market right now where it, the case it's just, inflation in was a historical phenomenon. And the case study in Japan certainly plays into that too. And, yeah, we've we've kind of gone to this idea where it's you know if, if there's a life cycle. There was a previous thing that where there was there could be inflation and we had to have central banks hike. And now that was a, a historical phenomenon and it died first in Japan and now it's died in Europe and it's dying in the United States. And then we'll move forward into a future where forevermore there will never be that again. Like that just feels like the intellectual zeitgeist. For, for the market and the economy right now among the sort of intellectual elites driving that culture on Wall Street. There, there's, just, there's just no appreciation of that whatsoever. And, you know, I, I, maybe that's true. I, I, I don't know. But it just seems like the, the, the idea that we could suddenly start to see, oh, wait a minute, no, this, this other side of the coin can happen as well, would just be a wrecking ball to things right now because it's so – it's so constructed in terms of being able to exploit extremely low interest rates and you know no longer having to worry about the fed and the idea that we can kind of cruise along with with only one side of the spectrum to worry about and that's just as long as we don't see manifest deflation we don't have a problem because there's nothing there's no boogeyman that lives on the other side of the spectrum and i think if you start to introduce something that's bounded on both sides you start to contain the situation a bit more and introduce new risks and it it fundamentally changes the equation and i don't know if it's going to happen but again i certainly think that it would be the 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 number one negative black swan possibility right now given how the house of cards the premises that underlie the house of cards we have in play Right, and I, I wouldn't point to this as the aha moment by any stretch, but I did find it interesting that in the ECB minutes this morning, Brett, um, there was some commentary about starting to see some signs of a pickup in inflation, um, also a bottoming in uh, the manufacturing sentiment, but uh, the comments from ECB chief economist Philip Lane was incoming data since the last monetary policy meeting pointed to continued weak but stabilizing the area growth dynamics. Measures of underlying in inflation remain generally subdued, although there were some indication of a mild increase. Hardly enough to get excited about, but this is the type of language that we want to see if it starts trending in the, in the opposite direction. Uh, something that certainly the data hasn't played out with, and uh, the sentiment data either for that matter, and definitely Fed speak at this point. Sure, absolutely. So, so, uh, you know, we'll continue to track this. As you know, Brett and I have been keeping a close eye on this. Um, you know, we, we got the reflation basket that we've been talking about with uh, copper and gold plays. Um, you, you know, this is just something that you probably want to have a small percentage of your portfolio in just to protect against that downside because why they might not be winners in 2020, the chance that if this did occur would be such an outsized winner for you, I think, Brett, that, uh, you know, it makes for a proper hedge to have at this time. Yeah, and I, and I would also say that, you know, one of the things that I don't think that people think about a lot with very long-term kind of framing of inflation versus deflation is 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 just demographics. And it, yeah, I mean, you can't help but see this valley that we've gone through 
between having you know the baby boomers being the driving force and the millennials becoming the driving force in terms of their their peak kind of productivity and consumption period of their lives which is pretty much when you're in your 40s and that's just around the corner for the for the millennials who are a bigger generation than the baby boomers so you know at least for the United States itself you're going to see uh, continued increase, a year-over-year -year growth in the in in the, in the labor force for people who are 25 to 54 years old, which is the most correlated data point for long-term inflation forecasting, and that's just gradually coming into the picture here, in terms of how people are are living their lives and, and the demographic variable. So that's not really that far out, and it has been a big long valley that's probably been a factor in putting down repression. And we know about, of course, the demographic situation in Japan that defines that as well and in Europe. So, um, I, you know, I think there are arguments that you can make that there are long-term forces that have been in play, that have maybe been in play for long enough to inure people to, the, to this idea of a fundamentally changed situation that may begin to start to change back in the other direction, really just right around the corner. All right. So, um, Brett, let's take a look at uh, that inflation um, discussion. I was planning on having that a little later, so we got that out of the way, and I think we um, gave it its proper attention. But why don't we take a look at some of the sentiment data here and sure. uh, look at how that's kind of impacting um, things. The one thing that was jumping off to me, of course, was that there was nothing on the overly pessimistic side. Now, I do believe you removed the um, dollar, um, yeah. the dollar positioning, which was a perpetually in that sector but that was the first thing that jumped out Not, there's no signs that anybody's pessimistic about anything um, at least in the key uh, the, the key readings that you follow now when we pop Correct. over to the optimistic side obviously a lot of things uh, in on that play no surprises there but uh, I, I think we, I guess we might as well start off with the Robo and Lobo because I know you pay a lot of attention to that. And uh, with that in mind, the Robo put call, I had at 0 0.43. Um, this was the lowest level since June of 2018 when it was 0 0.44. And I had to go back all the way to February of 2011 um, to mm -hmm. find it, which would have been just the, ahead of the uh, Grexit of... Uh, my memory serves me right. Um, but, uh, yeah, pretty much a lot of complacency out there when you're looking at this robocall ratio, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that one of the things that we're starting to do right now is fundamentally change the uh, the context for the market. And, and, and maybe if you look at the sort of the, the, the iconic sense of the different phases heading into an exuberance phase, which can last a while, I think we've done away with the notion of a wall of worry in this market. And we've been in a wall of worry kind of sentiment context for, you know, pretty much the whole time up until recently. And to me, one of those moments of really seeing that there's something that's shifted actually was the way that the futures behaved around news that that uh, that airplane had gone down in Iran. Right. We didn't even flinch. And I just I, I was just shocked by that. The notion that there was a the notion that this was coincidental and it just happened to be a technical failure is dismissible instantly. Obviously, this is correlated, but the market didn't flinch. And then it took back off further to the upside when we got more confirmation that, you know, that it's not really something that was an escalation of the situation. But it was just an interesting little moment. And the difference between a wall of worry kind of environment and whatever we've transformed into, there's, there's little markers along the way that give you a sense of the mode that the market is in. And I think the mode right now is something that's become more similar to the late 1990s than it is to anything we've seen before in this cycle. And if you pan all the way back to the late 1990s in something like the robo-ratio, it has a much lower downward extent. So the, the extremes that we've been dealing with lately, where you're around that sort of 0.45 area as an extreme, the extremes now, I mean, if you look at back in the year 2000, it was down at under 0.2. 
So you get, you can, you can, if you shift the mode, I think you get to the point where really the extreme starts to be in a different place. And I think we're seeing that across all the options data that we look at. So yeah. you can look at the robo, you can look at the option speculation index. Option speculation at, was the highest in 20 years. Yeah, but going back to the late 1990s yeah. when it was regularly at this type of score. Right. So once you get into that different phase of the bull market, I think you have to shift what you're calling an extreme. So all these things look like extremes, and I'm not so sure that you know these indicate that you should be shorting the market right now because I think we start to get to an area, a different, a different kind of landscape for options data where it becomes, rather than a hedging instrument, it becomes a derivative that can be used to profit from the market for people with smaller accounts who need the leverage. And you can have a whole cottage industry uh, uh, nursing that along, and I think that we can get to more dramatic extremes. So I think you have to be a little careful as you start to transition from a wall of worry kind of environment to a more exuberance-driven market um, when you're looking at options data as pure sentiment data because it just becomes a new tool in the toolbox for people who are looking to capitalize. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not important. It's important to see all of these extremes that we're seeing right now in, in options data, but I'd want to see, before saying we're in a a sweeping top moment like we saw in January of 2018, which was a different context. I'd want to see more confirmation um, among a, dumb, a number of different uh, uh, indicators that aren't all just levered to the options market. I, w I would say that I'm a little surprised that we aren't seeing more protection to the downside just because of how cheap it is, but I think that also works its way in too. Let well, me... there's the end of the wall of worry. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this this Brett we got options expiration tomorrow do you see this picture changing on Tuesday right obviously we got the three-day weekend with Martin Luther King on uh, Monday um, do you do you see this kind of changing a little bit on Tuesday is that those options expire or do you think that doesn't play too much of an impact if here it right did now? it would be really important I, I don't I think this is more just sort of a you know, a, a shift in, in, in what defines normality for this for this context. Okay. My second question for you, I just wanted to build off. This is getting a little off topic, but I was curious as to your thoughts. Um, do you think if it was an Airbus plane instead of a Boeing plane, we would have seen a little bit more aggressive selling action? Why? Because people were, were a little bit easier to buy into the idea that Boeing plane just went down. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So, I oh, I, 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 I see. You mean I, the Boeing brand is associated with crashes, therefore? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, still... I, th I think, and I'm, I'm not arguing the point with you, but like, you, you, you know how you can kind of get that avalanche going, and then it breaks the. I guess, but levels. man, yeah, but maybe somebody just said, "Oh, it's Boeing. Of course it crashed." But <laughs> exactly, you know, but I mean, we're still talking about with Boeing. It's still one in every five million oh. flights. No, so I know, the idea that it was that moment in Iran, right after they fired rockets, I, like seems like okay, you got to win the lottery two weeks in a row to get to about the same odds. I, I, you, you're not going to get an argument with me, but I, I, I just feel because you, you know, you know, um, selling could kind of um, build off itself. Because both, I was talking with you at that time. We were both trying to short the market at that time. And um, we had gotten the little bounce off of 3085, yep. and we had gotten back down, back around that 3110 area, I believe it was at the time. And um, we were both trying to s sell it, and it never rolled over. And that's when that flight got shot down. And what I yeah. think is that if it wasn't a Boeing flight, I think we would have gotten the rollover uh, in that short. But um, I just and, don't think it was there in the market. I think that yeah. what, what I, my short was about people putting on – Hedges, because sure. the hedges had come off. It wasn't about a material negative event. It was just, well, let's get we, – we would go back to – we would just see the hedges come in just as a matter of course, not because of the play, not because of anything, just the, the context suggests carrying hedging. And it was remarkable to me to see that it never came on. Right. So there was right. more of a fear. There was more of a fear of the damage – that hedging does to returns, then there was a fear of the damage that a crash would do to returns. And it, it a market crash, not an airplane crash. Right. Just, I, I, I just thought that was an extraordinarily eye-opening moment to me to see that that's where the fear is. There is a, there is a cold-blooded fear right now of missing out on full exposure 
to the market. And and that's building toward an extreme, but I think that's where you see a lot of these options ratios because we were very hedged and all those hedges have come off and are coming off and people are just, they don't want anything to do with puts because that's, you know, that's going to be something that just basically means you fall behind the benchmark. Right. Um, and uh, one of the aspects of this too, Brett, um, is I was just looking at those at extreme optimism. The high-low ratio remains on my radar because you continue to see it play out with a lot of these retail guidance numbers and stuff. You got winners and you got losers, and it's pretty uh, clear cut. We haven't seen that rising tide lift all boats necessarily, which maybe that's the point that we need this high low ratio to kind of come off and to see money put in, you, you know, those uh, Bed Bath and Beyond type plays, the L brands and stuff like that, in order to really hit that extremism that we finally start seeing things rattle. No, but I will say that uh, I think it's the first time in uh, five years that more than 85% of the stocks in the S&P are now above their 200-day moving average. Yeah, yeah, I did I did see that. Um, and this is also, when you're talking about it, um, not coming out of a prolonged downward trend either. So, I mean, not only the fact that 85% are over the 200-day moving averages, 85% are over the 200-day moving averages in upward trends. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, we are. And, yeah, that's – there's parabolic – there's a parabolic pattern. I mean, you can look – I showed the weekly chart for the S&P long term in my notes this morning as the lead chart. It just – you can see an unquestionable parabolic shape to this market. Yeah. Okay, now Brett, you wanted to address the uh, name exposure versus the aim exposure, right? Uh, the uh, name exposure is in uh, that optimistic uh, extreme right now. Aim uh, is not at that level quite yet, but you wanted to address the differences there, right? Well, I just want to make sure people understood that they're unrelated indicators. I mean, the, the aim is the advisor and investor model for anybody who uses. Uh, sentiment trader. The the you know the aim is is really an index of different things, and the N A A I M is the survey done by the National Association of Active Investment Managers. It's just a survey of active investment managers for you know are you leveraged long? Are you long? Are you neutral? Are you are you short? Are you leveraged short? And it tends to it tends to not be that much of a contrarian indicator. Interestingly, a lot of times it gets to an extreme early on in an important trend. So I don't know whether you can say that that's the smart money, but it tends to be something where, you know, it, it, it can get to a crazy extreme around the top. We saw that in December 2017, ahead of the January blow off, but it was early. So if you'd still bought with that extreme, you'd have still been in the market for a run up. Um, it tends to, to, to signal some bottoms reasonably well when it really craters but I just wanted to, yeah, to make sure that people understood that those aren't, aren't related indicators, that one is a good and interesting survey that's truly an independent data point from everything else. Okay. Um, we'll touch upon some of the other um, ratios. Quick question for you. Lobo, that was actually a little bit um, lower than it was a, a month ago. It's not as high as the robo ratio. Uh, that's obviously the larger, I think it's over 50 contracts in the Lobo. Um, so do you have, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, it seemed like they were more complacent a month ago than they currently are here. Yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, yeah, we dove, we dove, uh, uh, right back, right off the, um, I guess the, 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 the phase one trade deal agreement. Um, but you know, this is going to be moment to moment in terms of what transactions are happening on a given day, and if you have a number of of large transactions that are in favor of calls rather than in favor of puts, you're going to get down here. But still, generally speaking, if you just pan back or squint your eyes and take a look at from September until now in the Lobo, it's just been a steady move toward essentially reducing the role of hedging in portfolios. All right. So some of the other uh, readings that we're seeing that weren't an extreme, but we're uh, certainly edging into that bear market probability. Obviously, uh, everyone's thinking that's out. Equity hedging um, and hedge fund exposure. Now, I thought that was two interesting areas because that certainly suggests that there's more money that could be put into play here. Don't you agree? 
Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, the, the hedging is low, but the, I think that it's interesting that we've seen since we got the breakout, and we talked about this in the last chart book, we talked about this, you and I, when you get the new all-time highs breakout in the S&P, you tend to see a jump week over week or over two-week period in terms of correlation between the HFRX indices and the SPX on like a three-month rolling beta kind of situation. So you see, in other words, the moment-to-moment -moment swings um, relative to a context between the hedge fund tracking indices and the S&P, they start to sync up. And that just shows you that you're indexing for hedge funds who are looking to, whether they've got that as, as an alternate benchmark or whatever it is, when you get the new all-time high pop in the S&P, you tend to get a lot of indexing activity from hedge funds. So we got that big spike in, in correlations back about the same time as we were starting to run into that, uh, that trade deal. Um, but since then, it's actually kind of dropped off a bit. And that, that, yeah, and that does speak to exactly what you're saying. We could start to see, maybe this has been some doubt about valuations or whatever, and we could start to see that resolve back in the direction of uh, mounting exposure by hedge funds on the long side of, of this market. Okay, I got a valuation question for you here in a little bit, but let's just keep with this sentiment for one more question for you, Brett. Um, the AAII, uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, the bullish percentage was at 41.8%. This was up 8.8% from the prior week. Uh, neutral at 30.7%, uh, uh, which is basically within its historical average of 31.5%. This was down 6.4 percent, and then bearishness uh, at 27.5 percent, a little bit below the historical average of 30.5 percent. But similar to what we saw with the hedge fund um, positioning there, not really seeing extremes in these readings, are we? No, and that's why I kind of see the options data as being this interesting uh, uh, side situation. It looks like there's all these extremes, but if you if you look a little bit deeper and you think in terms of transitioning to a different environment for the market, I think that there are a number of indicators that can get much more extreme. And, and obviously, the the uh, I mean, any, any of the any of the surveys are kind of in in the same situation, and the AAII is certainly part of that. You, you know, you can see big spikes, and we do not currently have that spike. And again, for for People who just want to drill down into it, the AAII survey simply asks a selection of people who are relatively active uh, but non-professional participants in the market. The simple question, do you think the market's going to be higher, the same, or lower in terms of price six months from today? That's it. And, you know, we're very neutral about that question right now. So people aren't, and they, you know, bullish extremes, obviously everybody thinks the market's going to be higher. And it does tend to be, you know, it does tend to build toward extremes when the market has been strong. It's a, a kind of momentum contrarian situation, generally speaking. And when it really, when it really is, is good to follow is when you see a period of several weeks where it's been sort of, you know, nested at an extreme state. Um, you get the sense that, yeah, that translates into exposure, which translates into vulnerability if you start to get some hiccups. So it, it, you know, it looks like there's not a lot of exuberance showing up there at all at this point, at least from that, from that data point, and a couple of other surveys. All right. And then uh, one more topic, and then we'll break into some of the early reads on earnings season here, Brett. But uh, I, I found this one to be interesting. I actually threw it at Scott earlier. I don't know if you happen to be listening. But we have been seeing a pretty steady flow of analysts upgrading their price targets. Um, the upgrades minus downgrades is running nearly 100 stocks each day over the last couple of weeks. Um, that, that means a net upgrade and uh, targets of about 100. Um, however, they are not upgrading their estimates or fundamentals with it. This is more of just a phenomenon where they're upgrading their price targets, a little bit of FOMO trade. I guess, you, you know, if, if you're a Tesla analyst and you have a 225 target and all of a sudden it's trading at 540, I suppose in order to be taken seriously, you got to raise that up to about 300 or so. But uh, you got any thoughts on this activity here, Brett? Yeah, I mean, it's a the, – so I, I started right off, and again, in our strategy meeting, again, calling this the contextual bullish perfect storm. And what that means is that the, the, the environment, the context, 
is has there's a number of factors that come together, namely macro risks being taken off the table, a really easy comps environment coming at us over the next one to three quarters, and the Fed having made that pledge to not tighten no matter how good things get unless we have an inflation problem. That forms the context. And so that doesn't say anything about how things are actually performing, how well the economy is doing or how well uh, you know companies are doing in terms of their fundamentals, in terms of their forward outlooks. That doesn't say anything about that. But it's a perfect storm of positive context. So whatever performance happens is probably going to start to get a higher multiple. Right, you're reducing the risk. So we've been in a multiple constrained environment. It's, the, it's another way of saying the wall of worry phase is over. And I think analysts are starting to do the same thing with other looking at price targets. So if you're if you're in an environment where you're seeing the other side of that, you're seeing a more speculative, more exuberant market, and you're seeing some of the big risks being taken off the table, policy risks, uh, 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 geopolitical risks. Um, uh, comp risks, all these things are being removed as negative factors, negative potential factors. And, you know, we're starting to get past that wall of worrying into a more speculative environment. Then that is, you know, I think that that is the recipe for multiple expansion. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing. And the question is, just like we talked about with the economy, are we going to see that uh, uh, catch up by fundamental performance to justify that? Because that's the bet that's being made here is that, you know, the, the, the E will eventually catch up with the P. Right. And um, just to, so people are aware, the last time we saw these extremes was in uh, Q4 of 2017, which is uh, certainly an interesting time because, again, and you're going to see a lot of reference into January Extremes in what? Uh, these readings for uh, – Technical upgrades, outpacing fundamental okay. upgrades. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, right. So that's around that, you know, the, te the fiscal stimulus. Exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, just something to keep in mind because you're going to see a lot of people talking about that January 26 or January 29, 2018 uh date when we did see that rollover there's going to be a lot of talk about that so just looking for any sort of uh parallels potentially but with that in mind taking a quick look at earnings season brad i, I don't know how closely you've been following it but i've been pretty impressed out of the get-go now uh as of the 13th this is last week 12 of the 19 members of the s p 500 had reported q4 earnings this would have been through uh january 10th or or um 12 of the 19 members, excuse me, reported earnings better than what was expected. This is a little bit lower than 12 of the 19 members them. of what? 12 of the 19 members of the S&P 500 had beaten their there earnings expectations. There are 500 expectations. members. Yes. How are there 19 members? 12 of the 19 members of the S&P 500 that have reported so far. Oh, 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 I, I gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, sorry if sorry. I was confusing yep. you on that. No, that was so, me so, being stupid. So 19 you people were... out of the S&P 500 had reported. Only right, 12 of them beat expectations. It's a little bit lower. I mean, we've been seeing those numbers uh, uh, around 73%. Ratio, right? It is, because uh, especially when you go in the, the last three quarters, as I've been saying, this word defined is better than feared because expectations were so low. I feel like this is the first time around that we haven't seen um, those low expectations in place. Now, uh, you know, and this is working its way in estimates and everything is along those lines too. Of those beats, um, the uh, uh, companies have reported a 5.8% EPS surprise for Q4. So that is a little bit higher than the 3% surprise that's usually associated with earnings season here. Um, seven companies were able to actually post double-digit EPS growth year over year. We're dealing with mostly financials at this point, right? We're dealing with mostly financials at this point. Um, I keep breaking down some of the... Uh, um, companies that had already been out let's see if i got a uh so um nike had been the top beat so far um Cintas okay. was another one that was up there adobe darden restaurants lamb weston so a pretty nice uh collection there oracle they had beaten by 12 percent. general mills so you had some um consumer staples to the downside on um on the decline was micron uh, but, you know, people washed that away because of the Q1 uptick. And we saw Taiwan Semi today come out, and we'll get back to that in a second. 
Uh, FedEx was another weak one there. Constellation Brands as well. And uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance was another drag on some of these names. So um, over overall, a decent start, but not the best start that we've seen to earnings. Um, the banks were definitely strong, Brett, but this is one of the problems I have with us just completely blowing out of the waters here. The problem I had with the banks and was their outlook for 2020, particularly around net interest income. Uh, for my money, we needed to see some better econ data and some better earnings. And uh, perhaps we're starting to see that, which is washing away some of the concerns around financials. But I got effectively just saying they're they're anticipating a flat yield curve down to flat. Well, yeah, a, a flat yield curve from what we saw in 2019. So we won't. They, they're they're betting. A, they're 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 allowing themselves to forecast a bar that is defined by a lack of steepening of the yield curve. Correct. So if we get a steepening of the yield curve, they're going to blow out these forecasts. Exactly. And and that's what I'm curious to see how the market responds to some of the outlooks here. Now, we did get one of the... Um, I would be really curious, by the way, to see if those same banks, what their analysts are projecting as far as the yield curve. Yeah. Wouldn't that be interesting? If they're all projecting a steeper yield curve and then they give these... Forecast. Yeah, well, I mean, there's always that separation between the research department and the internal. I know, right? but it's, so, yeah, right, sure. But but they probably don't match up. I'd I'd agree with you, but um, and again, it's very likely that this could be discounted. Uh, certainly, some of the beats in the banks were driven by the trading um, uh, the trading segments, which might not be uh, duplicated in the upcoming quarters. But then again, so was, uh, there was a lot of weakness in the commercial side of things. Still, uh, there was some commentary about seeing at least a bottoming of that, but not really a bounce back just yet in the CapEx demand. However, I felt that the Taiwan semi earnings report kind of blew that out of the water and not so much the report as much as their Q1 guidance, which they're seeing an uptick of 45% in revenues year over year. A lot of this driven by the 5G demand in the telecom space, but this was one of the reasons why I took that long in uh, South Korea, EWY, just because I see a bounce back in that CapEx spend. But Brett, we talked a lot about in our last report, a bounce back in the CapEx spending. Um, what areas would you be watching closely in order to see that? Like, what, what's your biggest interest for this earnings season coming up, and what are you looking for on your side of things? Um, I, I guess, you know, I, I really just want to see if there's going to be a shift overall in my sense of business investment in general, because just that was the real trough over the summer, and there's a lot of theories about why we ran into that wall i've got my own understanding of it but a lot of people see it as more structural right now and as we start to see some of the leading indicators start to pick up steam a little bit are we going to see broad based and i'm not really looking at one sector or another so broad based we've seen the end markets stay strong and we've seen uh business investment decline over a period of months particularly last fall um, and, you know, do we see the other, other side of that coin as we start to get a little bit of confidence back in the system? Um, and I don't know how much, just like with the point we just made about the banks, let's say, you know, their analysts are calling for a steeper yield curve, but they know they can set the bar low by saying, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to capitalize on net interest side because the yield curve is flat. Um, you know, I don't know how much you're going to get, an, you know, an honest assessment rather than gaming you know, gaming analyst uh, uh, forecasts. So, um, I, you know, I mean, I would rely on, on your analysis in terms of where you see uh, surprises. So the Taiwan Semiconductor example is important and interesting, um, where you see something that looks like it's, it's something you didn't expect. So I would, uh, I would just rely on you for that, I guess. All right. Um, and just uh, another area, of course, is going to be the um, transportation for me. And with that in mind, we got CSX out tonight and uh, JB Hunt and Case, uh, Kansas City Southern tomorrow. So some key names to watch there. All right, Brett, we're about 50 minutes in here. Uh, what I want to do right now is just pop through some of the feedback questions that we've got in here. And uh, we'll address those. And then uh, we'll let you tidy this all up in a nice tidy bow as we break into 2020. But first uh, feedback question was from earlier. And uh, person was asking, would anybody be able to give some color 
on the repo operations the Fed is now doing. Perhaps a comment on the site about it. Uh, one, why is it suddenly necessary? Um, does this reveal a systemic weakness of some sort? And two, why are people saying this affects the stock market and props it up? Why would a technical banking issue like repos have anything to do with stocks? So, Brett, from my perspective, uh, a lot of this has to do with the regulation that is in under yeah. the banks. We've talked a lot about this, where the banks simply aren't able to uh, hold as much, many treasuries on their balance sheets, and that keeps them out from the day-to-day -day operations. I think it's something that could be addressed by the Fed in the in this year, um, how that you know, perhaps people would see that as more of a revenue opportunity for the banks and could provide another leg higher. But um, that it's pretty much pure and simple, just like that. I know it's large amounts that are being put out. I believe we're outpacing the Q3 uh, or the QE3 at the run rate that we're currently at right now. Um, does it reveal systemic weakness of some sort? I don't know if it reveals systemic weakness from my perspective, but as much as I think this was uh, a lot that was put in place 10 years ago, and the market's mm -hmm. simply outgrown it. That's how I look at it. Yeah, and it, well, it's a negotiation that's happening right now between the big banks and the regulators. And there's a game of chicken going on a little bit, I, th I think, to some extent. Does it reveal a structural weakness? It, it, it could in that um, if we're really going to have uh, this kind of regulatory context as a permanent feature, then um, it – causes inefficiencies and a game theory landscape that can become problematic. And then if we loosen those same regulations, that could then bring about the potential for um, systemic risk to build up based on uh, behavior that is, 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 is potentially destructive around the next corner. So it could actually bring about systemic weakness, but I don't think it's a response to systemic weakness. I think that, um, and money is fungible as far as the second part of that question. So when the Fed expands its balance sheet massively, you know, people are going to find a way to get that into asset prices. Right. Um, Brett, I think this next one's for you. I'm not 100% sure what they're referencing. Hey there, I'm curious as to the trend line, which you've drawn on the SPY chart. Uh, you have the trend over what I would have marked as the intermediate low on around December 20th. Could you explain how and what you're seeing, please? Is it, was this in reference to you, Brent? Uh, I apologize if it's not. I uh, don't think it is because the only trend line I showed um, was from a weekly chart, and I don't think that that's for me. If it is, then I'm not understanding the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, so... Uh, Perhaps uh, whoever wrote that. I think in, it might be from maybe maybe Scott posted it. A, it, it a it's, chart. it's very possible. The timing of it, I thought it might have been something that um, you had posted earlier, and the person was asking. But um, okay, so we'll just move along here. Um, so then there's a question about uh, Christine Lagarde um, in the ECB re ECB review. Um, and, uh, so basically with that, so the second ECB meeting is January 23rd, which is obviously a week from uh, today. Um, and there's a lot of speculation as to how much the ECB will uh, discuss their review in that. Now, I would just point out that the in the minutes this morning, there was no discussion at all of the review and given the fact that you got a lot of new people involved i don't see anything coming out towards year end on the ecb uh brett did you have any thoughts on that no all right so um yeah i wouldn't be looking for anything to uh occur there just yet you know that, that could be that's going to be a couple months down the road and then uh, the final question that I just want to address here, Brett, seems like everyone is talking about multiple expansion lately. Is there a scenario other than inflation that could cause yields to rise and flush some of these recent buyers back into bonds? Um, I mean, certainly a uh, earnings misses. I think that would lower that lower the multiple. Um, you know, we're currently trading at. What's saying? Is there anything else that could drive yields higher? 
as the cause. So is there anything other than inflation than that inflation. could yields up? I mean, geopolitical issues, potential. No, that would drive it down. No, yeah, right. So, I mean, it, you know, it, I think that inflation doesn't have to be manifest. Just if people, if people believe that we could be in an inflationary growth context, then you're going to start to see assets move out of the bond market and move into something. You, it, it, okay, so in a deflationary environment, I mean, the, on a big, big picture, long end of the curve is defined by the notion of whether you want to be a lender or a borrower. And that has to do with the return on invested capital in the present versus return on invested capital in the future. So the concept of uh, a deflationary environment is, is, is effectively that the return on invested capital in the present is low. So you'd rather lend money and get a return on that so that you get your money back in the future and then you can invest it in something when the return on invested capital is higher. So just the concept that we could be in an inflationary growth environment. Now, it doesn't need to be runaway inflation, just the notion that there is a large return on invested capital at present will cause people to not want to be a lender, but instead be a borrower. They want money now to invest in things so that they can pay it back later rather than lending other people now. So. You've got the long end of the curve. It's really a measure of that. If people pile into to long-term bonds, it doesn't have to be. I mean, inflation is about uh, you know how much of that return that you keep. So of course that's going to impact interest rates. But it's also about the types of return you can get on that capital. What's the opportunity cost of having it locked up in in ten-year notes versus you know starting a new business or putting it in equities or who knows what, buying a bunch of real estate. What if you think that you can make more from your money somewhere else, you're going to pull it out of long-term government bonds and invest it in something else to get that return. That drives yields higher. So you can get a, a steepening yield curve just on the basis of an increased appreciation of the return on invested capital in present. So we see uh, steeper yield curves associated with stronger growth environments. I think just an improvement in economic data, it doesn't have to be inflationary, would possibly start to pop those yields up. Um, it's tough to see how that necessarily pushes people back into the bond market because they see the higher yields because those yields are going up simply because people think the bond market is is not the place where they're going to get the best return. So I think that there's a, a fundamental problem in the question and the idea that yields rising is necessarily bad for the equities market. Right. And, and I, I think that there's... Uh... I mean, it's really tough to parse through it without it seeing inflation as some sort of root cause, because um, yeah. you know any any sort of pullback from monetary policy is likely going to be due to inflation, uh, be it the ECB, the Fed, Bank of Japan, if they were ever to see inflation again. So um, yeah, it's tough to see anything that would drive yields higher that would. Uh, cause people to flock back into the bond market that isn't somehow tied to inflation, I guess. But, um, you know, that's something that we'll continue to watch as it plays out here. Uh, Brett, so I think we're going to come to an end here. You want to uh, give us a nice recap here? Sure. So, uh, you know, as we started off, we've got this contextual bullish perfect storm kind of situation right now. So the, the context is is really positive and that's causing a change in the sentiment landscape and I think that it is it's peculiarly the shift from a wall of worry kind of environment to a more speculative more exuberant kind of environment which is a faster burning cycle it lasts less long it's not able to we've seen a very durable cycle it can slow burn seemingly forever without building up an excess of risk acceptance that puts the whole thing at, at risk. So we're now shifting into a different kind of market environment. Uh, we've gone around that corner. We've lost that wall of worry. We're starting to see a different normal level for options ratios. Something like we saw during the late 1990s, it can persist. If you start to see some of the things that have been sell signals and options ratios over the last seven, eight, nine years, Maybe they aren't sell signals right now because of this shift. Um, and the real interesting point will be, do we start to see a speculative buy-in, a speculative pull-in for retail investors, which really has not been a part of this bull market pretty much the entire time. We've never really seen this turn into a mainstream bull market. It's been pretty much a Wall Street bull market from 2009 on. And it's possible 
that that's a corner we turn to at this point. Um, but I think that we have to reset our idea of what's normal right now when we're looking at some of these core sentiment indicators. And we need to see, to start shorting just on the basis of, of sentiment, um, I think we, we need to start seeing a number of different confirming indicators that's got to include some of the, some of the surveys um, rather than just all the options ratios piled together to kind of get that. And the other point is I think we're starting to see feedback at this point. Um, we'll get more tests of that, but it seems to be the case that as we start to break out in this greater kind of risk acceptance flourish, that that's going to feed into positive leading economic indicators at last. We maybe saw a sign of that in Philly Fed this morning. We maybe start to see more of those. And if it looks like the Fed's going to stand pat in the face of that and reaffirm the idea that that's not going to be a reason to hike, that we need to see a genuine manifest inflation problem, that can really kind of turn this into a, a continued parabolic acceleration to the upside in the market. So I would, you know, I, I, I'm long equities on an unlevered portfolio, and I may still take pot shots on the short side in the futures when I see opportunities. But it's not something where I'm sitting here every day looking for the top to happen today. I think that this can burn a bit further, and yeah. we need to start to see things really kind of work through and, 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 and mature into the full version of what this looks like we're starting to see. Yeah, if you're sitting around waiting for that rollover, I think you could be sitting around for a couple of months here at this point. <laughs> And it's possible we have the carrot out in front of this market of easy comps in Q2 and Q3, which is going to be much easier on year over years than we saw last year at the same time. And it's tough to see something turn really problematic for this market ahead of that. Yeah. All right. Well, Brett, as per always, thank you so much for uh, joining us here. This is always fun. Love uh, having these discussions with you. Hopefully, everyone's getting a lot of use out of them. Uh, we will be uh, posting this here shortly. And uh, obviously, we'll be back again uh, next week as we break further into earnings season. And hopefully, are able to peel off a little bit more from the Q4 earnings and the outlooks coming up from these, com from these companies. All right. Thank All right. you, Gav. Talk to you soon, Brett. Bye-bye. Okay.